Hey y'all, welcome to the channel. Thanks for all the recommendations. Today we're checking out History of Britain. The United Kingdom is a nation located in the British Isles, made up of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Got it. Thousands of years ago, the Isles were inhabited by long-forgotten pre-Celtic people, known as the Beaker Culture, named for their distinctive pottery beakers. Little is known of them, but it has been suggested that these people laid the foundations for the mysterious Stonehenge, ah. a series of heavy standing stones which were transported from 150 miles away and arranged to form a calendar, marking the days of the summer and winter solstice. Over time, waves of Celtic-speaking people arrived from the European continent, who soon came to form the Britonic, Gaelic and Pictish people. These people were not a unified people, but were rather many tribes who shared a similar pagan religion, language and culture. Huh. The Romans invaded, conquering what's now England and Wales, but failed to conquer the Pictish tribes to the north. The Romans launched several campaigns into this land they called Caledonia. However, their fortifications were soon overrun and abandoned, and they retreated to Hadrian's Wall. Their conquered lands were incorporated into the Roman Empire, becoming the province of Britannia. They brought Roman customs and laws, improved infrastructure and connected many towns and cities with Roman roads. When the Romans left, there was a great migration of Germanic tribes. These were the Jutes, Angles and Saxons, with their language Old English. Their settlement pushed many Britons to areas in Wales, Brittany and a kingdom known as Dumnonia, while Scotland eventually evolved into four kingdoms. What? The smallest of these were the Scots, who were originally from Ireland, the Britons of Strathclyde, the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Bernicia and the Picts of Alba. For unknown reasons, the Jutes disappeared from history, but the Angles and Saxons eventually formed seven kingdoms. Wessex, Sussex, Kent, Essex, East Anglia, Mercia, and Bernicia became Northumbria. This is sounding a lot like Game of Thrones. After the collapse of Dumnonia, the remaining territory of Cornwall fought against the powerful kingdom of Wessex. Cornwall eventually fell under the control of Wessex, but it managed to keep its own culture. Wales at this point was also made up of several separate kingdoms, <laughs> the largest being Gwynedd in the north, Powys in the east, and Dufford to the south. What a mess. The British Isles soon saw numerous Norse raiders from Scandinavia. These were the Vikings, and they began settlement on many of the Scottish Isles, the Isle of Man, and they even founded the city of Dublin in Ireland. No way. The Scots huh. and the Picts then decided to unite under Kenneth MacAlpine to form the Kingdom of Alba. The Kingdom of Alba grew strong over the years, and eventually Strathclyde was brought into the fold. Meanwhile, Danish Vikings arrived in the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms for conquest. After fighting the King of Wessex, Alfred the Great, the Dane Law was formed, a land where the laws of the Danes held influence over the Anglo-Saxons, controlling the region and its affairs. My gosh. The Anglo-Saxons eventually defeated the last Viking King of York, Eric Bloodaxe, and Athelstan became the first King of the English. Although, the newly formed Kingdom of Denmark would conquer England and even found a short-lived Danish dynasty under Canute. Really? The Norsemen had a dramatic no impact on the Isles, so it's no wonder some words in the English language have Norse origin. After defeating formidable sea raiders from Ireland, the Western Isles, Scandinavia and Anglo-Saxon forces from Mercia, Griffith ap Llywelyn subdued his rivals in southwest Wales. Llewellyn became the only Welsh king ever to rule over the entire territory of Wales. He was defeated by the English Earl Harold Godwinson and killed by his own men, leading to the Welsh kingdoms splitting apart once more. At the death of Edward the Confessor, there was a succession dispute between four claimants. Harold Godwinson was elected as king and managed to defend England from an invasion by the Norwegian king Harold Hardrada. However, Harold had to march his army south to defend against Duke William of Normandy, who had crossed the English Channel. According to tradition, at the Battle of Hastings, Harold was killed by an arrow to the eye, and the Norman invaders were victorious. I have heard of the Battle of Hastings, <laughs> for the record. The new King William defeated a number of rebellions, built a new design of castles called Moat and Bailey. 
What is a moat and bailey? Is that what he said? A moat and bailey castle is a medieval system of defense in which a stone tower on a mound is surrounded by an area of land. Pretty brilliant design, actually, you know, if all you have is dirt and trees and stone. Way to go, William. And introduced a number of reforms, like trial by combat. Let's have trial by combat! And the Doomsday Book. Hang on. What's this Doomsday Book? Oh, okay, so it basically kept track of the land values, and it was called the Doomsday Book because it was unalterable, like those of the Last Judgment. The Norman dynasty invaded into South Wales and parts of Ireland, creating the Lordship of Ireland. At court, nobles spoke and conducted sessions in the Anglo-Norman language, which endured for centuries and left an incredible mark in development of modern English. After a brief civil war, Henry II would marry Eleanor of Aquitaine, establishing the Angevin Empire, beginning a long rivalry against France. Richard the Lionheart <laughs> defended much of this territory, and also became a central Christian commander during the Third Crusade, achieving considerable victories against his Muslim counterpart, Saladin. Under King John, heavy taxes were imposed on his barons in order to pay for his expensive foreign wars. Not much has changed, I guess. The barons rebelled and forced John to sign the Magna Carta, a charter that established the principle that everyone was subject to the law, even the king, guaranteeing the rights of individuals, the right to justice, and the right to a fair trial. Seems pretty basic, but I guess that's only, what, 807 years old. Most of North Wales remained independently ruled by several Welsh princes, until 1216, when Llewellyn the Great became the ruler of the Principality of Wales. This would be the case until Edward I, who conquered Wales in 1284, effectively becoming part of England. At the oh. death of King Alexander III, Scotland was left with 14 rivals for succession. To prevent civil war, the Scottish magnates asked Edward I of England to elect a claimant. John Balliol was elected king, but was constantly undermined by Edward, who opposed Scottish independence. Elected? Edward decided to launch several campaigns to conquer Scotland and depose King John, to which he acquired the nickname Hammer of the Scots. Under a brave Scottish knight, William Wallace, the Scots mounted resistance against the English, <laughs> defeating them at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Edward marched north in person and defeated Wallace in battle, but Wallace managed to escape. He was later captured and executed, but his efforts allowed Robert the Bruce to rise up and defeat the English, securing nice. Scottish independence. Yes. When the King of France died without an heir, Edward III was technically eligible to the crown, through his mother. The French court denied his claim and instead installed Philip of Valois. Edward paid homage to Philip as he owned the lands of Gascony, and was essentially a vassal to the King of France. Due to disagreements, Edward reasserted his claim to the throne and invaded France beginning the Hundred Years' War. A hundred the English years. achieved notable victories at the Battle of Crecy, Poitiers and Agincourt thanks to the technical superiority of the longbow, but was unable to conquer the French with the appearance of Joan of Arc, who lifted the French spirit and turned the tide of the war. Okay, so Edward III had to fight William Wallace and Joan of Arc? That's a lot to deal with. Upon the death of Edward III, an entire generation was skipped in the line of succession, which prompted bitter rivalry between several claimants. Most notably were the Houses of York and Lancaster. Tensions were high until a bloody age of warfare erupted between these two factions in the Wars of the Roses. Right! It's so in-depth and complicated, this period will likely become a video of its own. The wars ended with the arrival of the Tudor dynasty. Henry VIII wanting a divorce split with the church creating his own Church of England. This ultimately led to a series of religious differences between future English monarchs. In between his six wives and naval adventures, <laughs> Henry gave Wales representation in Parliament, and created the Kingdom of Ireland, but realistically he only controlled an area known as the Pale. In addition, Henry's paranoia and suspicion amounted to tens of thousands of executions, including his friends and wives. What? Tens of thousands of executions? Is that what he said? ...area known as the Pale. In addition, Henry's paranoia and suspicion amounted to tens of thousands of executions, including his friends and wives. Wow! Tens of thousands. Amazing. I watched that show, The Tudors, which was really good. 
Uh, and I don't remember that as part of it. Maybe they didn't show it. They just talked about it and I fell asleep or something. But tens of thousands of executions. Henry, get a grip, buddy. Did you eat all of those people? During the 16th century, the largest and most powerful empire was Spain under King Philip II. England, under Elizabeth I, were helping Dutch rebels reject Spanish rule, and many English privateers were also intercepting Spanish silver on its journey back from the New World. This angered the Spanish king, and the final straw came when Elizabeth had Mary Queen of Scots executed, because she did not want Scotland falling under Catholicism. The Spanish Armada, consisting of 130 ships, was deployed to invade England. At the Battle of Gravelines, an English victory forced the Spanish fleet to sail around the British Isles before storms in the north of Scotland destroyed the remaining ships. Crazy. In retaliation, the English, led by Sir Francis Drake, amassed their own armada to invade Spain, but this too became a failed endeavour. Born in this period, William Shakespeare became a renowned poet, playwright and actor, who contributed significantly to English literature. When Queen Elizabeth of England died without an heir, her closest male relative was James VI of Scotland. James was elected as King of England and Scotland in a personal union, although wow. the countries remained separate political entities. Okay. As the first monarch to rule the entire island of Great Britain, several assassination attempts were made by Catholic conspirators. One such assassination attempt was the gunpowder plot by Guy Fawkes, who tried to blow up Parliament. These bits and pieces are coming together. I've heard of Guy Fawkes. Uh, yes, I've heard of... Yes. So Guy Fawkes was Catholic? I didn't realize that. It seems like he would be against that kind of organization. I guess I'm confusing that with the movie V for Vendetta. You know, because that V for Vendetta guy would not be into Catholicism, I don't think. After a failed colony known as Roanoke, England established a successful colony known Virginia? as Jamestown, which would eventually evolve into the 13 colonies. USA, USA, USA. At first, expeditions to the New World were mainly driven by religious motives, which were predominantly to convert the natives to their faith. But colonies became more profitable, as demand for New World crops like tobacco and sugar increased. British ships also made a monopoly on the transportation of captive African slaves that crossed the Atlantic to the Americas. Millions of Africans were shipped in cramped, horrific conditions to work on brutal plantations in the Americas, and essentially Horrible. became property to their masters. For 300 years, this practice continued in the British Empire until it was fully abolished in 1833. This period also saw a wave of plantations in Ireland, where Irish lands were confiscated and given to English and Scottish settlers. That's Tensions up. would rise between Charles I and Parliament. Following disagreements, conflicts between royal and parliamentary authority within England led to the English Civil War. The country became divided between parliamentarians, known as the Roundheads, and royalists, known as the Cavaliers. Under Oliver Cromwell and the New Model Army, the parliamentarians defeated Charles and executed him for treason. Cromwell became Lord Protector and dissolved the monarchy, but shortly after his death, it was restored under Charles II. Charles II married Catherine of Braganza, and when she arrived from Portugal, she introduced the greatest beverage of all time. Tea. Tea had been no used way. by China for centuries, but its arrival in the 17th century captured the interest of the English aristocracy. English tea is from Portugal. Or China, really. Amazing. Tea had been used by China for centuries, but its arrival in the 17th century captured the interest of the English aristocracy, and soon captivated every other Englishman. In 1685, a Catholic James II became king in a largely Protestant nation. James's daughter Mary and her Dutch husband William were both Protestant, and many nobles unhappy with the Catholic king invited William to become king. Ah. William found considerable support when he invaded, and he was soon crowned King William III in what became known as the Glorious Revolution. He invaded? Although William's supporters dominated the government, there remained a significant following for James II in the Scottish Highlands. Clan MacDonald of Glencoe was one such group who had not been prompt in pledging allegiance to the new monarch. For this reason alone, 38 members of the clan were murdered in what became known as the Massacre of Glencoe. After Scotland's failed colonial endeavours in Nova Scotia and Panama, and an economic crisis in the 1690s... I... didn't realise Nova Scotia was a Scottish colony, 
but now it makes sense. It, the name Nova Scotia. What does Nova Scotia mean? Nova Scotia means New Scotland in Latin. No way! Of course it does. Why didn't I ever... I feel like an idiot. I am an idiot. No, I'm just ignorant. I'm uninformed. I'm uninformed. We don't learn that in American public schools. That it's not my fault. After Scotland's failed colonial endeavours in Nova Scotia and Panama, and an economic crisis Panama? in the 1690s... Hold on. Was a Panama was a Scottish colony? What? That sounds so bizarre. Okay, so Panama's not a Scottish word. It's just... That's what it was called. Okay. 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 I'm learning here. I'm learning here. I'm learning. Of Glencoe. After Scotland's failed colonial okay, endeavours okay. in Nova Scotia and Panama, and an economic crisis in the 1690s, there was a union between England and Scotland, forming the United Kingdom of Great Britain. Okay. The House of Stuart had ruled happened. Britain for just over a century, but ended with the death of Queen Anne. Sophia of Hanover was the granddaughter of James I, and her son George became king. Great okay. Britain soon found itself drawn into several European wars most notable being the War of the Spanish Succession and the Seven Years' War. Victories in these wars resulted in territory for the Empire, particularly in North America, although it resulted in considerable debt. In order to make up for this debt, King George III ordered heavy taxes be placed on the 13 colonies. Oh. This, among other- It's that King George. Oh, ho, ho, ho. From Hamilton. In order to make up for this debt, King George III ordered heavy taxes be placed on the 13 colonies. Here it comes. This, among other reasons, culminated into the American War of Independence. And with financial help from France and Spain, the Americans were victorious. USA, USA, the East India Company, which was founded by Elizabeth I, had grown rapidly, and even operated its own military and controlled a sizable amount of territory. The company had set up fortified warehouses where they traded with many Indian rulers, acquiring important luxuries like textiles and spices. Hmm. One of the most important cities of all was Bengal, as it had a large taxable population. The governor of Bengal, Robert Clive, ordered that the population grow opium to export to China, instead uh. of growing food as it proved to be a great source of income. However, when a famine struck, it resulted in the deaths of millions of people. Meanwhile, Captain James Cook arrived at New Zealand and the southeast coast of Australia, although he wasn't the first to discover the area because of past Portuguese and Dutch explorers. However, unlike the Dutch and Portuguese, Britain claimed it as their new penal colony, <laughs> known as New South Wales, with the first convicts arriving in 1778. A new threat had emerged from France, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. That guy. Waterloo? 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 Napoleon had come to dominate most of Europe. Wow, look but at Britain's that. Britain's advantage was that she was an island, and the Royal Navy had become a major force at sea. Invasion of Britain was near impossible, and in a series of coalitions, Napoleon was defeated. By the mm. end of the Napoleonic Wars, Britain was growing rapidly into a superpower based on their supremacy of naval engineering. Furthermore, in Ireland, the Great Famine struck. A disease killing potato plants. Right, I've heard of that. Ireland, which had merged with Britain, relied heavily on this crop for food. But the British government forced Ireland to export what little food they had to other areas. Why? Without any aid or food, Ireland's population plummeted by half due Evil. to starvation and emigration to countries like the United States. <laughs> Things weren't looking so great in India either, as India was rebelling against company rule. The East India Company had employed many Indian soldiers known as Sepoys, who were under the command of British soldiers. These Sepoys grew increasingly unhappy, and a revolt soon occurred, yet it quickly failed due to a lack of unity between Indians. After the rebellion, the British government took direct control, with Queen Victoria being declared Empress of India. Look at that tiny little crown. And she thought that looked good. Wow. During the 19th century, the world was forever changed by the Industrial Revolution. Society was transformed by technological advances and increasing mechanization, and would launch Britain to global dominance. 
Some of the greatest innovations and inventions were the sewing machine, the fire extinguisher, steam-powered engines and turbines, the electric motor and photography. The telegraph was also a major invention, as a message could now be sent from Britain to India in a matter of hours. The yeah. establishment of rail... There must have been such a difference. ...as a message could now be sent from Britain to India in a matter of hours. The establishment of railways and trains also transformed transport forever. Instead of travelling days by horse and carriage, it now only took a matter of hours by train. Nice. Engineering and communication advances not only united the empire, they triggered a manufacturing boom like no other. People flocked from rural areas to city centres for jobs. Productivity reached an all-time high, but the consequences of mass migration resulted in extremely cramped and polluted cities. Hmm. However, with these problems that were generated, it resulted in an improved sewage system. Newcastle focused on shipbuilding, Manchester the cotton industry, Liverpool became a major trading centre, Middlesbrough fixated itself on iron and steel works, the presence of iron ore, limestone and large coal deposits in the West Midlands and South East Wales prompted the establishment of ironworks, and Scotland boomed in the linen industry. Hmm. The Victorian era also saw a major change in society, as families from the poorest backgrounds gained access to education although nice. it was much stricter than today's standards. The 1860s also saw the rise of the greatest food combination ever, fish and chips. <laughs> I love fish and chips. Towards the end of the 19th century, European powers came together at the Berlin Conference to divide Africa between them. A group in South Africa known as the Boers, who were originally Dutch settlers, proved difficult for the British. The Boers lived in two nations, the Free Orange States and the Republic of Transvaal, and both resisted British rule using guerrilla warfare. To counter this, the British placed many women and children in their tens of thousands into concentration camps, where many died from starvation and disease. Britain became a major player in the First World War, and many men proudly volunteered to serve and protect their country. The Great War, as it was called, saw the use of new technology, such as dreadnoughts, warplanes, artillery, machine guns, mm. grenades, chemical weapons, bolt-action rifles, and the first use of the tank. Many right. faced horrific conditions in the trenches and witnessed gruesome battles. Millions died and many returned home shell-shocked by what they had seen. Man, that's the horrible. Empire reached its territorial height in 1921 after gaining territory from Germany and the crumbling Ottoman Empire. The Empire now ruled over 400 million people and controlled wow. one quarter of the world's landmass. Wow. But the reality was, Britain could no longer afford to build bases or ships to defend its empire as it had before 1914. Ireland finally managed to break away from British rule, Congratulations, the Irish Ireland. Free State, and shortly after became a republic. The Second World War was more brutal and horrific than the first. Most of Europe had fallen under German occupation, and under Prime Minister Winston Churchill, Britain stood strong during the Battle of Britain and the Blitz. Britain were extremely successful at intercepting and decoding enemy communications, with the likes of Alan Turing who cracked the German Enigma code. The war ended with an Allied victory, but many nations within the Empire felt a desire for independence, and it was clear the Empire was about to break. India was one such nation, who were ready to declare their independence. Mohandas Gandhi practiced a non-violent approach, and this proved successful, nice. as shortly after India gained independence. Congrats, India. The Commonwealth of Nations was formed to improve relations and economic ties with former colonies. This still remains today, with 53 members united by language, history, culture, and shared values of democracy. Cool. The British Empire officially ended with Hong Kong, Britain's last colony, being handed over to China in 1997. The Empire committed many atrocities on many different people, imposing their culture and civilization while often wiping out native ones. Yeah. On the other hand, this brought about globalization and the uniting of the modern world. And without such innovations and industrialization, the world might have been a very different place. The United Kingdom suffered a small economic recession in 2008, but has since recovered. We had that too in the US. It is a multicultural society with each region retaining a presence of its history and culture. If you ever visit, look out for the Welsh cake, the haggis, the whiskey, the Chelsea bun, the parmo, the Cumberland sausage, the Yorkshire pudding, or the Cornish pasty. 
I've heard of Yorkshire pudding, and I've heard of a Cornish pasty. I've never heard of any of the others. Oh, whiskey. I've heard of whiskey. Yeah. Never heard. Oh, and I've heard of haggis, but I've never had it, because I know what it is. The UK remains a member of NATO, United Nations, and the World Trade Organization, yeah. and uses the pound currency. In 2016, a referendum resulted in 51.9% of voters in favour to leave the European Union. Although the countries within the United Kingdom became divided on the matter, leading to the many questions of its future unity. Yeah, how is that going? I know that's recent, but how has Brexit affected things now? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching. Really great video. Very interesting. It's fascinating to see these centuries and centuries of wars. And I can only wonder how that must impact the population and natural selection of the people that come out of it. If you have a population that is constantly fighting these wars, the people who are bad at fighting get killed off. The people who are good at fighting survive and end up procreating. So you end up having a population of people who are really good at fighting and killing. <laughs> So it makes me wonder how that maybe influenced the spread of the British Empire. They were good at fighting, and it probably had something to do with centuries and centuries of wars. It's inspiring to see that the British Empire was able to make peace with a lot of the territories and colonies and evolve into a more empathetic organization. Thank you all for watching. See you next time. Bye.